Hey, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you all for joining us and, and sending a really warm welcome to you here with us today. Um, and so this is our first Research and Evaluation Network uh, webinar for the year. Um, and the theme of the webinar today is systems evaluation thinking um, and parallels to results based accountability uh, with an example of how to apply the three steps of SET. Um, so yeah, this gen uh, topic has generated a lot of interest with over 100 registra registrations for today's event. Um, so yeah, thank you. Um, if you're new to our network, welcome. Um, if you've joined us at a previous event last year, thank you for your continued support um, in these discussions and our research and evaluation uh, network journey so far. Um, so this is also the first time we're trialling using Teams instead of our Zoom account. Um, that we used last year. Um, so please bear with us if we do have any uh, technical difficulties along the way. Um, just to note also, uh, based on the feedback we received uh, from the network last year, we've changed the format of these webinars to now fit within a one hour time frame rather than a, an hour and a half, um, just, just to keep things uh, more manageable in terms of time for everyone's busy days. Um, so for the agenda today, I'll just click through my slides, there we go. Um, so I'm going to give you a five minute introduction and quick uh, overview of our network and tell you a bit more about our research and evaluation forum. Um, I'm then going to hand it over to our guest speaker for today's event, Dr. Louis Atkinson, who will give the presentation on systems evaluation thinking. Um, so there'll be some opportunity for some Q&A um, and I'll highlight uh, some upcoming opportunities that you may like to get involved with as well. So uh, in terms of housekeeping, um, so by default, uh, I've already mentioned uh, you will be on mute, um, but your camera will be turned on. Uh, this session also will be recorded. So if you don't want your face showing in the recording, please do feel free to turn your camera off now. Um, if during the Q&A you would like to ask a question, uh, you can write the question in the chat. Uh, there is a Q&A function on Teams, um, but we prefer that you use the, the chat um, to the chat pane. Um, and the other option is you can also raise your hand um, using the raise hand emoji um, and then take your off mute, yourself off mute and ask the question. Um, when you're asking a question, just please introduce yourself and what organisation you work for um, so it's easier for us and for Louis to um, tailor our responses. Um, if we run out of time in the Q&A, we can also follow up uh, individually with you after the session. Just um, pop your question in the chat function as well. Um, and also, yes, we will be sharing a copy of the PowerPoint presentation. Um, yeah, thanks, Frank. Uh, Patricia, sorry, <laughs> thanks. OK, so uh, firstly, also, I would like to begin uh, by acknowledging the traditional owners and, and custodians of this land, the oldest continuing cultures in human history. I acknowledge the younger and Turrbal uh, peoples of the land on which I work here in Mianjin in Brisbane. I'd like to repay, uh, pay my respects to all First Nations colleagues joining us online today. QCOS thanks First Nations peoples for the gift of the Uluru Statement from the Heart, and we look forward to supporting work leading us to a successful uh, referendum to enshrine a First Nations voice to Parliament in the Australian Constitution, followed by Makarata and Treaty. QCOS welcomes the invitation to walk with First Nations peoples in a movement of the Australian people for a better future. Uh, for those online, please feel free to join us in acknowledging country where you are today uh, through the chat function as well. Uh, so my name is Amy Dellett. I am the data and reporting analyst in the research and policy team at QCOS. Um, and a component of my role is to coordinate these research and evaluation network meetings um, and webinars and our online forum. Uh, so the purpose of the Research and Evaluation Network, um, in terms of membership, these network meetings are open to everyone as they're about um, collaboration and sharing resources. However, social service staff in research and evaluation roles are particularly encouraged to attend. Um, so if you want to join or if you have any questions from today's session, please get in touch. Um, also, as a heads up, if you're new to the network, you may want to review our uh, terms of reference, uh, which we'll send out in the post webinar email. Um, and also for reference, our team's email is on the screen here. It's research at qcos.org.au. Um, also, I had a question um, and to make things a little bit more interactive, um, I thought I would try and use an instant poll. So 
again, bear with me because I haven't done this before. Um, so I will look for the polling, which I can't see. Let me see. More. Polls. Oh, just because it's small on my screen, sorry. <laughs> so if you're new to the network, I would love you to send me a love heart. So I'm just going to try this instant poll. It might um, come up, take a second to come up on your screen. And um, while you're sending me a love heart or, or if you've been connected with the network before, you, you, you can send me a love heart anyway as well. <laughs> um, so just going through the purpose of the research and evaluation network, um, the network is about collaboration and knowledge sharing uh, with the intention of identifying shared challenges and emerging issues in the community services sector, um, which allows us to then respond and provide advice on matters relating to research and evaluation. Um, it's really also an opportunity to share perspectives and shape the QCOS research and evaluation agenda as well. So our aim is to deliver a community of practice that promotes collaboration and sharing uh, of knowledge in relation to evaluation methodologies and outcome measurement for community services. Our network adopts a strengths-based participatory focus that leverages, draws on current value and draws on and values current knowledge um, and expertise and capabilities that exist within the sector. Um, so if I can look at the instant poll, I can see 39 love hearts, which is lovely. Thanks, everyone. Um, so I'll close the poll and I'll just pop on our chat again. Um, so also, I just wanted to flag with you all, uh, we have a new research and evaluation resources hub. Um, so you can access all of the network webinar recordings from the hub, um, which is on Community Door, um, and it's under our research and evaluation resources hub page. Um, so you can access it by clicking on the link. Um, also, I'll share the link through the chat function as well. Um, and we'll send uh, this link out through the post um, uh, after the session for today as well in an email too. Um, so I'm just going to pop that link in there now. Happy to receive any feedback um, from the resources hub too. Just waiting for my slide deck to catch up here. Sorry. Okay. Um, so lastly, also um, some of you may be aware that we're trialing a new format of communication with our network um, from November last year. Um, we've since invited um, all of our network members to join this forum um, from January. Um, and the forum is called the QCOS Research and Evaluation Network Forum, um, and that sits within the Microsoft Teams platform. Um, so if you're interested and you want to join um, the forum, it's a two-step process. Uh, request to join uh, can be submitted through um, the, the link, the Microsoft Teams EOI link on your screen at the moment. Um, and when we receive this request, we can add you as a guest user and send you a welcome message to the forum as well. I guess the idea behind the forum is that we're providing a space and an opportunity for our network members to collaborate and exchange ideas, um, to access professional development opportunities. Um, it's really the best way to stay up to date with uh, any news about the network as well. Um, so I'm not spamming people's inboxes too frequently too. Um, so for users that are already on the forum, uh, you may or may not want to check your notification settings as well so that you receive alerts about when people are posting to the team. Um, and just finally, um, there is three channels on the forum. So there's a channel that's set up to create a general dialogue um, for the Research Evaluation Network members and for forum participants. And ideas for posting um, in that channel could be around, you know, opportunities for professional development, useful resources or tips and tricks, uh, brain brainstorming solutions and challenges, um, sharing le learnings and reflections and um, topics that are related to any of the Research and Evaluation Network activities. Um, there's also an ideas and feedback for um, channel on the forum as well, which is around, you know, it could be suggestions for guest speakers or um, specific topic areas of interest, uh, what activities or resources or webinars you found most useful and why. 
Um, and lastly, there's also introductions and networking channel. Um, and this channel is really just an opportunity to introduce yourself and the work that you do. Um, you can showcase and highlight the great work you're doing in your organisations or share some of the challenges that you're facing. Um, we really love to hear from members about how you're collecting and analysing, reporting and visualising and sharing data. Um, so I really encourage you to engage with the forum and share some information on what kind of evaluation and, reject, uh, and research projects you're working on. Um, the more we're able to share and the more we can learn from each other. Um, so yeah, I hope to see you all on the forum um, online soon. Um, now it's my pleasure to introduce our guest speaker for today's event, Dr. Louis Atkinson. Louis has been teaching systems thinking since joining the Haynes Centre in 2012 um, and guides boards and their leadership teams to apply systems thinking to both strategic planning and evaluation projects. Haynes Strategic Management is a global leader in the application of the systems thinking approach to develop strategy that supports successful growth and diversification of their clients' businesses. Um, and their centre is a global team of strategic management specialists, master consultants, trainers, facilitators, and coaches who help their clients to identify strategic disruptions, enable breakthrough innovation, positively impact business results, and enhance their business brand. Louis will provide a brief introduction on systems evaluation thinking um, and highlight the parallels to results-based accountability. Louis will explore top tips to plan and evaluate community, community service projects using systems thinking concepts, such as both AND and systems thinking for learning, nested systems uh, levels of learning, resequencing systems questions for success, and co-designing for better results using systems architecture. Um, I had the pleasure of first connecting with Louis last year um, and I watched uh, a tea and bun session that he was facilitating with Ruth Knight. Um, so I, I've also learned that he was involved with some of um, QCOS's early work um, in 2015 around outcomes measurement, which is really exciting. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm really grateful to have you here today um, to share your extensive knowledge around all things systems evaluation thinking. Um, so yeah, at the end of Louis' presentation, we'll have some time for Q&A and I'll now hand over to you, Louis. Um, thank you so much for joining us. I'll just Thanks, uh, stop, stop sharing my screen as well. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. And it gives me an opportunity to share my passion, systems thinking. I'm just launching this presentation. Can you see the full screen? Yeah, we can. Okay, think. great. Awesome. Right, so um, really this morning's as much about um, my personal um, uh, exposure to system thinking and uh, the different uh, people and um, approaches that have influenced me over the last 20 years to help me get to where I um, am today in terms of my practice, which is underpinned by the system thinking approach, which is all part of the Haynes Centre that you've already heard of before. I might add too that um, uh, I try not to be too evangelistic about system thinking. Obviously, I love it, but um, you'll see that we've got an open mind on different approaches to uh, addressing issues and challenges that are in front of us and in our lives and in the communities that we're part of. Uh, my first uh, uh, meaningful engagement in systems thinking was this guy, Steve Haynes, who was the founder of our organisation. Uh, he passed away in 2012, but I first met him in 2009. And he um, said that uh, if life on Earth is gathered, governed by the natural laws of living systems, then a successful participant should learn the rules. So there are a few things um, that I think you may intuitively already know, but um, I'll share them in a systems context with you and then look at ways of I've seen it, they're being applied in practical solutions to a range of different challenges. First of all, I want to acknowledge um, the country that I'm on. It's Barambin, the windy place. So for those of you who are familiar with Brisbane, it would be familiar with Barambin, which is in brackets, Victoria Park, and also adjacent to the QUT campus here in Kelvin Grove. We take the time to recognize and acknowledge the traditional people of the lands and water where we meet today, the Yagara and Turrbal people of this area. 
We acknowledge these traditional custodians who cared for these lands and waters for thousands of years and their descendants who maintain their spiritual connections and traditions. We we'll recognize that these have always been places of teaching and learning. We strongly encourage justice to promote understanding and pay respect to our elders past, present and those emerging. Before you continue your journey today, please take a moment to honour the millions of footprints that have travelled these dreaming pathways by Auntie Nicole Williams, a local traditional owner here, Calvin Grove. So another way to say what Steve said, it's harder to survive in the jungle if you've been trained in the zoo. And today we'll be contrasting two types of thinking, analysis, which helps us understand how stuff works, and synthesis, which helps us understand why stuff works. We've been taught analysis in our education systems, and it, it's about taking something apart to understand the properties of uh, and behaviours of that part taking, taken separately. It's the foundation of scientific progress. Uh, whereas fewer of us have been taught this notion of synthesis, so as to understand the thing is a part of something, understanding the behavior of the bigger whole, which is the which of which it is a part. This is called more holistic thinking. So we've been we've been taught analysis, otherwise known as reductionist thinking, which takes something apart to understand the properties and behaviors of the part taken separately. As I said, it's the key to scientific progress. Whereas few of us have been taught that sense of the synthesis, the systems approach to understand how the thing that's a part of is making the whole work. One way to think about the difference between this reductionist approach and a systems approach is this commonly used metaphor, silo thinking, thinking in silos versus thinking as a whole. This is a cute little illustration down the bottom of the slide, which is taken from the banks of the Tamar River in Launceston. On the left-hand side, you can see the original wheat silos that were sitting for almost a century on, on that riverside um, as the area used to trade in wheat and other cereal products. And in the last 10 years, it's been transformed into this same structure but it's a, um, it's a luxury hotel. So what you can see here in, virtu in virtual form is going from silo thinking to holistic thinking, turning something into a whole functioning complex. System thinking is the combination of both of these types of thinking, the holistic top-down view of the world and the analytical understanding the parts and how they fit together. So it's not either or, systems thinking is both and, both holistic and in analytical thinking combined. And it's that paradigm which I want you to sort of hold in your head as we work our way through the slides that I'm gonna share with you over the course of the next few minutes. So let's think about these laws of living systems, as Steve, Steve Haynes said, that governs the world. The first law is that systems can only be understood and defined in the context of the higher level system that it's part of, the environment within which it exists. Second law, systems are made up of a group of interrelated components that work together to support the objectives at that greater whole. And the third law is if there's no relationship between the components, there's no system. And that's a really important three concepts to hold in your mind as we work our way through today as well. And you'll see these themes repeated again and again in the various frameworks, results-based accountability and systems evaluation theory that I'm going to share with you over the course of the next few minutes. Of course, None of this is new. 
I'm not the Messiah bringing the tablets down from the mountain. This type of thinking, these laws have been in place for many, many years. And they've been resurfacing again most recently in the book written by Tyson Yakaporta, Sand Talk, where he's been talking about how this sort of thinking has been in place in First Nations communities for millennia. It's the way they work. Similarly, and probably not as such a long a time frame, Buddhist and Taoist uh, traditions, the way those societies and philosophies integrate, have all been based on this principle of interrelationships, the core premise, everything is interconnected. So what I'm sharing with you today is not something that's just emerged in recent times. It's been fundamental to the way our societies have worked for many, 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 many years. So just to guide you through your thinking, as I share what I'm going to share with you, we're going to be talking about the parts. We're going to be talking about how the parts come together to form a whole. We'll touch a little bit more, but we've probably already discussed this idea of reductionism. But critical, a key property of a real system where the parts are interacting is this notion of emergence. And this is the critical thing that I think differentiates many other approaches uh, to evaluation and um, assessing systems. The systems thinking approach really focuses on this notion of emergence. And of course, uh, the parts of the puzzle, and this is why I illustrate this with this jigsaw puzzle, each individual piece of that puzzle does not give us the image or the emergent property, which is the elephant there. However, it's only when these parts interact that the emergent property of the image of the element emerges. And of course, as we get more complicated in the sort of systems that we're working with, we're dealing with these non-linear feedback loops, which we'll talk about again a little bit uh, shortly. But finally, it all um, comes together in this most recent concept that I've been working in, this notion of systems evaluation theory. So if you're going to make some notes about this uh, presentation, think parts and what you're learning about the parts. Think whole, what you're learning about the whole and the interrelationship with the parts and this idea of emergence. These three concepts are really important. So how do you define a system? So we've got a piece of clockwork there as one example of a system. And, and uh, Ray Eisen, an Australian, again, a very prominent and well-recognized system thinker says, it is an integrated whole whose essential properties emerge from the interdependence between its parts. And this emergence, the idea of emergence is really quite powerful because they are those that arise through the interaction among the smaller parts that make up the system. No single part can exhibit that emergent property. So it's really important to understand that. But the interesting thing about uh, a, a clockwork as a system is it's what we call a deterministic system. So it's really quite a simple way to explain how parts interact to make a whole to generate these emergent properties because both the parts and the whole have no choice. They're predetermined behaviour and that's because their structures are set. So let's continue with another example, talking about how parts come together and interdependently create the property of the whole. A car is another example of a, of a deterministic mechanical system because they don't have much choice in their own. Their purpose is served by coming together and creating the value of the whole. And the interaction between these parts, so there's hundreds of parts in the car, but uh, and none of them actually work by themselves because they need to work with the other parts interdependently to fulfill their purpose as part of the whole system, which is the car. And that those parts come together as subsystems 
And again, none of those subsystems can actually deliver what we're calling the emergent property of the whole car. They can do cooling, the motor can run, uh, they can supply fuel, they can do steering, but none of them can deliver what they can achieve when they appropriately interact, which is when they come together, create this emergent property of a car, which can transport you safely from point A to point B. So what are the tests to meet the system? What are the things that need to test to meet the systems test? Well, first of all, all parts are needed for the essential property of that system to emerge, moving you from point A to point B. The second test is if a single part is missing, then the car won't run well or at all. So it's a central system property may not emerge if that part is missing. And so the other thing I want you to hold in your head is what we're going to start talking about in terms of systems is more than these basic mechanical deterministic systems. We're going to start talking about human systems. And a system can also be a complex intervention that we're uh, introducing into a community or a society or an organisation that, that we're looking for interaction between those parts to change the outcomes of what we're trying to achieve. So at the Haines Centre, when we start working in systems, we recognise that organisations are these multi-minded, multi-purpose social systems that are, are a part of something larger, which is a purposeful system called society. These parts in human social systems are all goal-oriented and each of them in contrast to a deterministic system, which is a mechanical system, are driven towards self-preservation and self-development. And the whole itself is also goal-oriented, which will thrive best when those parts work well in a dedicated, integrated way to serve the outcomes of that whole. So let me dive into systems thinking. So I've described it earlier as a combination, both an analytical, and synthetic thinking, but just as importantly, I think system thinking is about learning. So what are the top tips to plan and evaluate using systems thinking? What we'll touch on are these four, four things, nested levels of learning and thinking, resequencing questions to encourage learning and reflection, We'll talk about co-designing systems for better results using this idea of systems architecture. And then we'll close with a brief introduction to systems evaluation theory and how that seems to bring it all together. So let's start talking about nested uh, levels of learning thinking. As I said earlier, I think my first formal engagement with um, with systems thinking came back in 2009 when I first met Steve Haynes, but I'm, I'm actually trained as a chemical engineer. And I now realize in hindsight, and you'll realize this when you go on your own systems thinking journey, how you were systems thinking in the past, you did, didn't really know that you were. And this example in chemical engineering is every chem chemical engineering problem that needs to be solved, the first thing you do is draw a boundary around the system and you try and understand what's inside and outside this boundary. And the purpose of that is to be able to do these uh, clever things that chemical engineers do, which is uh, mass and energy balances around a process part within a broader system. So the system boundary is a really crucial first thing to be able to understand. And it, what it enables you to do is understand how to separate the system, the parts that are interacting um, from its broader environment. And it's really important to be able to do that when you're thinking about evaluation of systems. In particular, it helps you understand which perspectives are needed. Um, who are the stakeholders that are really, really crucial to making the system work and who's um, more peripheral but important to the system and its performance. 
And the thing I like about this particular cartoon is the reality we see every day, different people can look at exactly the same circumstance and see a completely different context, just like this uh, castaway on the island versus the man on the boat. Um, each of them see exactly the same situation, but in a completely different way. The other important reason why it's important to define your boundary, it gives you an idea of the scope and therefore the cost of the sort of intervention you're trying to explore using a systems perspective. Uh, there are systems within systems within systems. This idea of nesting is a really important systems con uh, concept. Each systems level is nested and interconnected with feedback loops moving between each level as well. And that's where you start to see those non-linear non feedback loop effects starting to affect um, the operation of a system and the way the parts work together. And that's where the complexity of human systems starts to come into play. And to give you an illustration, um, these are the eight levels of living open systems. So you can see it starts right down the bottom with the cell, a cellular level, all the way up to level eight, which is the earth and the different layers or expanding systems levels in between. The first one that I've circled there is around uh, the person, organs and individual. So at a person's life as a system level, that's one system level that you might want to consider understanding better. But then you can move up another level and understand that person's part of a team or a family, and also maybe even possibly in an organizational context, a part of a, 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 um, a, a, an organization or a not-for-profit entity or a company. So that's another system level that's interacting, obviously, with the level below, which is the individual level. And again, importantly, too, when you start talking about community as a system, this is where you start to think about the place-based approaches to understanding um, delivery of interventions as well. And not but the important thing is you've got to understand that there's individual nesting inside organisations, nesting inside this whole community. And then finally, when we start talking about the ecological level that we're working at now, particularly when we're thinking about climate change, et cetera, you can see how there's individual system nests inside the, the, uh, the, the uh, organisational level to the community level to the whole of the planet level. So these interrelated -nest, inter nested systems start to make these uh, interrelationships very complex. And that's why understanding the feedback loops, the non-linear interaction between them is really crucial. One way we try to make it easier to grasp these concepts is we use this notion of the Russian dolls and how they're nested inside each other. If you remember, there's a tiny little doll, which could be the person, and the next one's a little bit bigger, next one's a little bit bigger and bigger and bigger. So that idea of nesting is a really crucial concept to grasp when you think in systems. This is where I start to try and relate what I've been talking about to a couple of methodologies. And the very first one that I came across in 2012 that I could see systems embedded inside was this uh, was the um, results-based accountability approach as presented by Mark Friedman. And Mark was advocating this moving from ego systems to ecosystems to come up these solutions at a population level of results at a population level that are derived from interacting parts at the next level down. So Friedman said, what RBA is trying to measure whole population level change and moving from these ecosystems to ecosystems, because it is extremely rare that any one program can change a population condition. It can only largely be a consequence of the efforts of multiple programs. So you can move to the next star slide. Now I'm trying to illustrate this nesting concept, RBA and boundaries. So results-based accountability talks about accountability at the, um, at the interacting program level 
and then also accountability at the whole of population level. And this is where the notion of emergence, the emergent outcome that we're all striving for at the population level is as a consequence of the way programs interact at a client level. The emergent property are properties of system, the complex in intervention itself. If you think about something like reducing homelessness or social isolation, that's the challenge, and we've got a lot of programs working at the client population level, but the emergent property we're trying to create as a consequence of those interacting at the program level is something like community connectedness. That would be an emergent property we're striving for if the interactions at the client population level work well. So the whole population, community connectedness as a consequence of effective interactions at the client population level. And that's what people often refer to also as the collective impact, the emergent property that can only be assessed and measured once components at the population level, have, uh, at the client level, sorry, have been well integrated. Friedman goes on to talk about this idea of fractals. Building on fractal foundations for scale up. Friedman says system thinkers see social structures and government bureaucracies as fractal entries, entities with similar structures, progressively larger and smaller scales of magnification. That's called self similarity, where each part is like the whole, but smaller. RBA sees program systems as the same evaluate. And he also says major reasons why programs fail is because they're being held accountable for showing change in longer term outcomes that they have very little influence over. They're, those things are happening at the population level and they can't be held accountable for those. So he's a huge advocate for systems thinking, noting the fertility and nonsensical requirement for having individual independent programs measure and report changes in emergent properties of a system of which they're embedded. So what Friedman's talking about is his idea of breaking down these silos, descaling the bureaucracy, you can see on the left-hand side, and then understanding what works and then putting it back together and scaling back up to achieve network effects from the work that's happening at the, at the level of the um, client population. So, and this is very consistent with another um, systems thinker that I'm a great fan of, Peter Drucker. And he says, management is about doing things right. Leadership is about figuring out do, how to do the right things. And it sounds very subtle, but it's quite pro profound, the two things. So just to illustrate, I'll go to this notion of recent sequencing questions for learning. So most of us are familiar with this classic program logic uh, flow where we, we, uh, we have a linear uh, sense of transformation of inputs into outputs. But what I'd like to contend is that is you might be really efficient at converting your inputs into outputs of getting enough clients and doing enough sessions and, um, and, and creating outcomes at a, at a case plan level, perhaps. So converting inputs into outputs, but success is by chance. And what we mean by that is there's not a lot of learning going on there. What we'd rather see, rather than going from left to right in a linear way, what we encourage people is to start thinking about the output you're trying to achieve first and then close the loop in a feedback loop whereby you're sensing, then reflecting, and then understanding that you're actually doing the right things because it's effective um, success by design by using feedback on the inputs that you're creating. And systems leaders understand the difference between effectiveness and efficiency and they manage time most productively at this intersection. So once you know you're spending time on the right things, then it's time to get efficient and doing it more effectively. 
Now let's talk about how you co-design systems for better results. And this is a wonderful um, uh, quote by Edward Deming, uh, the founder of Quality Assurance. Again, another um, systems thinker, um, but it was never called that in the past. And he said, your system is perfectly designed to give it the results you're currently getting. Now that's pretty insightful, I think, because um, if you want to change the results, you've got to change the system. That's the, that's, if you like, the analogy to um, that statement. And the way you go about changing the system's results is by adjusting structure, work processes, linkages and inform information flows to meet these new needs. So just to give you an example of the iceberg metaphor that we use for system structure, uh, we, the thing we all know about the iceberg is what you see above the surface is just the tip. That's the outcomes or the results. So if you want to change what you see above the surface, that's what we call the emergent property, then what you need to do is go below the surface and explore changing processes, structure, and culture by adding resources and building competencies below that surface, and then you'll get a different result. And this is a really nice slide that illustrates how that works. You can see what we're very uh, prone to do is try and tackle this tip of the iceberg, the wicked problem with the hammer, the simple solution where we know the real work needs to be done below the surface to change what's happening above the surface to get new results. So that's the iceberg just represented in a different way. And I just want to acknowledge Systems Innovation Network for providing that diagram. And it's just human nature to go for those simple solutions. So this let me illustrate um, what emergence means in by adding another example. Um, it's horse riding. And any of you have done it um, and it's worked out well for you, it's exhilarating. It's a wonderful thing, but all the parts have got to come together for that successful outcome. So there's me on the horse and, of course, there's the horse. They're two parts and we're co-acting together. We're interdependent in terms of achieving this emergent outcome, which is uh, a successful riding experience. Now, there's other things that need to come into play, and this is what I want to illustrate here, what's process and what's structure. The structure is the terrain. Is it flat or is it hilly? That obviously is going to have an impact on the success of my riding experience. Is the space open or enclosed? That's another structural thing you need to be aware of. In terms of process, it's the training that the horse and I do together to enable that particular moment to emerge as a successful experience. Of course, another structure is the bridle and saddle that keeps me on the horse in a safe way. And of course, the, another process issue would be the food to give us energy. So the horse needs to be well fed and we're both got to have enough energy to do that. And so there's many other process, many other structure examples that uh, you could think of to lead to that successful emergence of a positive riding experience. So let me finish with some um, insights from the last piece I want to share with you. So I've talked about results-based accountability. Back in 2012, when I was first exposed to that, I could see a lot of systems theory underpinning uh, the way results-based accountability are structured. Similarly, and more recently, I've come across Ralph Ranger, and we've worked together thinking about systems evaluation theory. And that's the copy of the front cover of his book that he's just released. And we'll give you more details on that in a second. The thing to really emphasize here is he, he regards a system as a complex intervention that's acting as a system. So multiple programs trying to work towards a shared outcome, whatever that might be. So here is um, Ralph's model, systems, uh, systems evaluation theory, and I want to focus on step one. There's three steps, and what I want you to do is think about how he's combined analytical thinking with holistic thinking into this model as well. So 
uh, step one, we work on the system. We're what I call up in the helicopter, looking at the, the whole system. And so the first thing we do when we're up in the helicopter, we're thinking holistically, we're trying to understand what part, well, what, what is this intervention a part of? We can see there's parts inside the system of which it, it's contained in a bigger system. We can see levels. So I was referring to levels earlier. We're thinking about scaling as well. And of course, we're thinking about the boundaries. So this first phase of, of systems evaluation theory, step one, is a holistic perspective on the system as well and defining the, barrier, the boundary. We're, the second step, step two, this is where we drop inside the system and start to understand the interdependence of the parts. So this is where we start to get analytical as well. And there's a lot of tools that Ralph uses to start to peel back uh, the understanding of how the different parts are interacting, whether they're effectively interacting and whether they're efficiently interacting. And he identifies uh, things that uh, under that relate to this interdependence of parts, uh, are things called cascading events, reworks, reflex arcs, and these feedback loops, these non-linear feedback loops that often influence the effectiveness of the parts working together as well. And then finally, the third step is getting back up in that helicopter and checking on the system as a whole to try and understand this emergent property that these interacting parts of a system are trying to create that none of them by, by their own can actually achieve. It's only in the interaction between them. So we're back up looking for evidence of emergence and holistic integration. And this is where the magic happens. Evaluating system emergence is all about its effectiveness. Where And, and the effectiveness is to ask whether the interdependent parts were successful in allowing the emergent property that you're trying to achieve. So you think social isolation and loneliness, there's lots of programs in the system trying to solve that problem, but are they collectively allowing this notion of emergent, of a community connectedness to emerge? Just as an example, there's lots more resources that I'd love to be able to share, but uh, here are the links. And I think uh, we're going to see those links in the chat as Amy provides them uh, in a moment. But the thing I'd like to highlight is Ralph and the book, and he's doing book clubs. You can go on, on Amazon and buy it, of course. I'd like to also uh, give a shout out to Ruth Knight, um, who uh, who's also worked with Louise on this particular um, document, but I think is really well worth having a look at using systems change to improve child and family well-being, and that's available. Um, uh, you just don't download it, that that link there. Of course, um, I'd like to also let you know if you want to know more about systems evaluation theory. There's a workshop coming up uh, next month, ninth, second, and the ninth of March. There's a link there for that. There's my details here, and then finally, I'd like to just share with everyone that this year. The Australian Evaluation Society is having its conference in Brisbane in September this year as well. Great opportunity. Um, they're open for papers to be submitted. Thanks very much for your time and open to questions. Thanks for the opportunity to share my system thinking journey. Um, and my Assurance to you is that once you explore and immerse yourself in systems thinking, you'll cross what they say, the Rubicon, and maybe never think another way again. Thanks for your time. Thank you so much, Louis. That was excellent. We've got lots of um, people going in the chat and um, you've given me some homework to do because <laughs> I um, I have the Sand Talk book uh, in my bookshelf and I haven't read it yet. So oh, I'm haven't. going to go Shame home and you. read it. <laughs> I'm going to read it now. Um, and yeah, it's just, just really interesting. I guess I had a question as well and I think um, Courtney mentioned in the chat. I don't know if, Courtney, if you want to take yourself off mute and ask the question or you're happy for me to ask it. We've got about five minutes for question time. Um, 
So um, I might ask it for, for Courtney. Um, so, and, and my question was quite the same as well. So in terms of, you know, like an appetite from government and funders to incorporate systems evaluation thinking in our evaluations, like what do you think of that? Is, is there still like a long way to go before it's an acceptable like form of measurement or is it, is it a bit more accepted these days? And, and Courtney's um, comment was, this is so interesting because frequently the government provides funding for um, and grants to develop a program and scale it up immediately. And there isn't room to go, um, there isn't room for to go A, B, C, D, E, rather just A, B, C. Mm. Um, so what do you think of that one? Um, well, I think uh, if I take you back to the um, iceberg metaphor and the slide I put up second after the iceberg, I had another diagram which showed wicked problem and easy solution on the tip of the iceberg, but a lot of complexity below the surface. Unraveling that complexity to change system results takes a lot more time and effort than throwing the most readily uh, available solution at the symptom. And I don't have, I'm sure in this audience, I don't have to draw too strong a, 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 a parallel to what we're seeing in the Northern Territory at the moment. And it's clearly, uh, uh, most of the talk is about the symptom, whereas the I, what I feel is the educated people who understand the communities in that area are talking about what's below the surface at the bottom of the iceberg that no one can see but everyone knows if we did the hard work below the surface we'd get a different result above it won't happen overnight though that's the challenge it takes time maybe two five ten years mm. well, that's really interesting i love um your different understandings as well that you you give to the application of the the program logic i haven't yeah. actually seen it kind of in that perspective before where, you know, you've got the foundational stuff with the program lo logic, but kind of takes it that step further with incorporating learning. Um, did anyone else have any questions um, before we just do a quick summary? Um, I'm aware there's a lot of things going on in the chat. Um, so uh, I might just read them out and then um, if anyone, if we don't get to some of the questions, then we can take them offline. The chat will be available after the session as well, where we can continue our discussion too. I, I can see the chat pumping through to <laughs> Amy, which is really exciting. Thank you very much for being so engaged, everyone. And I just want to emphasise that what I just shared with you, um, uh, I've accumulated over my experience and seeing opportunities to apply. And I wouldn't share them with you if I didn't think they worked or I'd seen them worked before. Um, and so I just want to encourage everyone, if you if you do have the capacity, just to start your own journey with the simple things that I've shared with you now. You don't have to go and do a master's in systems thinking or anything like that. I'm not saying you should do that. But some of those things, I should, even the iceberg, what a simple powerful tool and when I first saw it I think wow why didn't I know that all my life sort of thing or even just drawing boundaries around things and understanding you know what are the parts and what's outside the boundary that, I, that aren't necessarily going to achieve this emergent outcome as well so it gives you a chance to focus your energies limited resources you have for maximum effect and and this the other aspect of the iceberg which I think is really powerful too I didn't really emphasize today is that idea of leverage the the further you go down under the surface towards the bottom of the iceberg is the greatest leverage to get real change but the deeper you go the harder it is so there's this trade-off too Absolutely. Yeah. Also um, want to acknowledge Ruth as she's online as well um, and she'll be our guest speaker further later on um, with the in the year with the network. Um, I'll just read out a couple of comments. So um, Catherine, um, she's saying, I think in our field we use system thinking in practice and, and difficult to apply to evaluation given the parameters of funding, etc. So it's more, yeah, on the ground that this is how we operate and the complexities of how they operate too. 
Um, so Paul's also asking, is there a case study with examples that details how the theory has been applied, including outcomes, examples, actions, etc.? And can we share that? I did see um, someone mention all the papers that Ralph Ringer has written. Um, uh, it's just, no, it's, it's yeah. www.justevaluation is the website, you know, .com in the States. And he's got a, a fantastic, he's prolific. Um, he's written hundreds of papers and the most recent ones are in about 2020 onwards, have a number of examples where he's applied uh, system a systems evaluation theory. So you can get that for free if you like, like you don't have to buy the book. Obviously what's in the papers is in the book anyway. Um, and he's very generous with his time and space and stuff. He's a wonderful man. So uh, if you just wanted to reach out and ask Ralph directly, that'd be well worthwhile. Of course, um, at this AES workshop that's coming up um, beginning of March, we'll also feature case studies as well. Wonderful. Okay, thank you so much, Louis. Um, yeah, a really big thank you um, for being so generous with your time today and sharing your knowledge on this topic. I think we've got a lot of follow up to, to go through with with yourself and, um, you know, to continue this conversation with the network as well. It's really exciting. Um, so yeah, really appreciate your enthusiasm to share with the network. Um, and I just wanted to, um, I think before we go, uh, if I can share my screen again, um, just flag a couple of upcoming um, uh, opportunities to get involved with. Um, we're also launching some polls. Uh, if you can provide some feedback on how you think we went today, that would be amazing. Um, so my computer's just struggling to catch up a little bit, so just um, if you can complete the polls when they pop up on your screen, that would be really great. Thank you. Um, I did want to share. Um, uh, try, I'll try and share my screen one more time. Um, sorry, it's struggling a little bit, but I wanted to share the plan for the network um, over the course of the next few months. I'll try um, again, Amy. I've just unshared. So oh, nice. okay. Wonderful. <laughs> Maybe that was what I was struggling with. Oh, there we go. Yes, that might have been the issue. Oh, there we go. Okay, uh, so it's 11. So I'm sorry if it cuts out actually. Um, so there's a couple of saved the dates. So we've got a quality collaboration network, um, which is going to be on cyber security in the context of quality and compliance. So we've got that coming up on the 15th of February. Um, we've also got our next uh, research evaluation network, which is on the 2nd of March. Um, and just in the horizon, um, this is kind of the plan for the network in the next uh, six months. Um, so yeah, lots of really exciting topics um, to focus on there. And yeah, I'll send these out with the, with the resources for the network as well. Um, so you can see what's coming up. Um, and that was based on uh, feedback that we received um, at the end of last year on um, what topics everyone would like to see um, this year. So yeah, I just wanted to thank everyone um, for your time today, um, engaging with today's discussion. I really hope you enjoyed the new format of the webinar as well. Um, and we look forward to seeing you next time.